Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 61, The Vital Need to Decolonize, featuring Ajamu Baraka, a human rights defender whose experience spans four decades of domestic and international education and activism. Ajamu Baraka is a veteran grassroots organizer whose roots are in the Black Liberation Movement and anti-apartheid in Central American solidarity struggles. He is an internationally recognized leader of the emerging human rights movement in the U.S. and has been at the forefront of efforts to apply the international human rights framework to social justice advocacy in the U.S. for more than 25 years. He is now a national organizer for the Black Alliance for Peace, whose activities we discuss in this episode. Baraka has taught political science at various universities and has been a guest lecturer at academic institutions in the U.S. and abroad. He has appeared on a wide range of media outlets, including CNN, BBC, Telemundo, ABC, RT, The Black Commentator, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. He is currently an editor and contributing columnist for The Black Agenda Report and a writer for Counterpunch. We talked about the recent airstrikes by the U.S. on Syria, how foreign policy was virtually ignored during the 2020 presidential campaign, the bloated U.S. military budget, the global reach of U.S. imperialism, neoliberalism as an expression of fascism, alternative media and social media, decolonization, and the need to dismantle the United States, the structures of white supremacy, the dependency of techno-industrial culture on colonialism, following indigenous leadership, the necessity of revolutionary change, the weak organizational culture in the U.S., and the importance of acting in solidarity with social struggles around the world. If you like this episode, please share it on social media. That really helps. And subscribe to the podcast so you'll be alerted to future episodes. To support Voices for Nature and Peace financially, you can make a one-time donation at paypal.me or Venmo to username Colibri, that's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. You can also become a member at patreon.com slash Colibri, where you'll get early access to most episodes and to exclusive content, as well as having some goodies mailed to you. Thank you for your support in whatever way that you're able to offer it. Now here's my conversation with Ajamu Baraka. Jamu Baraka, thank you very much for joining me on my podcast today. I really appreciate you spending some time with me. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. I uh, really wanted to talk to you today about U.S. foreign policy and also about resisting the effects of U.S. foreign policy, both here and around the world. And today, it seems like the best thing to do is to start off by talking about Syria because of the airstrikes that just happened there. So maybe you could first just make a comment about well, what's happening there and uh, a situation that um, for many of us seems complex from the outside. Well, I mean, it's really, really unfortunate that the signal that was sent by the uh, Biden administration is that in many ways, uh, he's picking up from the Obama-Biden administration. He seems to be saying to the world that um, that uh, a new sheriff is in town, uh, but that sheriff has the same old agenda, which is to aggressively project U.S. military power 
in order to attempt to bully uh, and to advance um, U.S. strategic interests. It also suggests that uh, there will be no more sensitivity to international law from this administration than it was from the um, Trump administration and indeed probably even from the Obama administration. That is that the U.S. will uh, still, still attempt to um, uh, pursue its interests uh, within the bounds of law or outside of the bounds of law. There is no legal justification for the U.S. to act, actually be in Syria. And so when it engages in military actions related to Syria or to Iraq or whatever, um, it is engaging in actions outside of the bounds of law. So it becomes very difficult for the U.S. and the Biden administration specifically to pretend to uh, usher in a new era of respect for international law and democracy and human rights uh, when it, it's, it continues to project a, uh, a model of lawlessness. So it's really unfortunate uh, and telling that um, with this decision uh, and the response from elements of the liberal press, uh, that uh, there seems to be an inability to see the contradictions of praising this kind of action uh, and the, the implications that it might hold for U.S. policy and U.S. Uh, presence in other parts of, of the world. What do you see some of those implications as being? It's very difficult for the U.S. to uh, restrain a state, so for example, like Turkey, from engaging in activity that will be outside the bounds of law uh, when uh, they will argue that they are only trying to protect or advance their national interests uh, when they see that the U.S. engages in the same kind of activity. So it has a corrosive effect on international law and international standards. Uh, it is, and, and, and you know, and that corrosive effect really uh, took off uh, with the, uh, the so-called war on terror launched in, in 2001. And, and what we have now is in many ways, it's almost like a, a, a international, a Hobbesian international state of nature uh, the, where the strong survives. Uh, the strongest, uh, they're the ones that are able to advance their interests. Uh, and when you have a, an environment like that, uh, then there's no, uh, there's no telling what might happen. It's a very dangerous situation. Right, right, very dangerous. Well, uh, Russia is still a party that's involved in the Syrian situation as well. So isn't that part of the danger of being involved there? It is if there was, you know, there was a, a, a concern that uh, when the forces were more tightly uh, engaged that there could be the possibility of some kind of accident that could easily lead to an, an escalation. Uh, but over the years that the engagement has, has been, uh, uh, that possibility has been lessened. There's been a bit of a disengagement. Um, and a lot of that disengagement took place in the latter part of the Obama administration, but also during the Trump administration. As difficult as that was uh, with the Trump administration having hanging over his head, this notion of it being uh, Trump being a Manchurian candidate uh, and, and not pursuing the interest of the US, but in fact, the interest of the Russians. And I smile because it, I mean, the, the whole conversation was just so incredibly ridiculous, but it has such serious implications. So, you know, the possibility of a nuclear uh, accidental engagement with the uh, Russians uh, is a lot less today, uh, but is still concerning that uh, there can't be a complete disengagement uh, from Syria uh, and, and allow for the players in that region to work out um, the issues and to bring about some peaceful uh, resolution of uh, more than two decades of military conflict in that region. Right, and in this last uh, election that we just saw, the campaign in 2000, uh, I felt as though there was less discussion of U.S. foreign policy during that campaign than during any campaign in my life. And the first campaign I remember as an adult was, um, <clears throat> pardon me, 
<coughs> pardon me, 1988. Um, and uh, I remember I, I, uh, I was living in Minnesota. I caucused for uh, Reverend Jackson that year. And looking back at, at, at his, um, looking back at his platform, then it seems very far to the left of where the Democrats are now. And certainly had a lot more to say about U.S. foreign policy and about nukes and all that sort of thing. It seemed mm -hmm. like this last election was just Trump or not Trump. And so we didn't, there was no discussion about how a Biden administration might be different. It really wasn't. I mean, it wasn't um, within the context of the, of the bourgeois press uh, doing the so-called uh, debates. Uh, I think someone counted up uh, and I can't remember exactly the, the number of minutes of all of the debates, um, the number of minutes devoted to foreign policy was less than one hour uh, total. But yet you see that once the Biden administration takes, uh, takes power, some of the first initiatives uh, that they engage in has, is a, is, has foreign policy implications. So it's really incredible that because of the, the weight of responsibility that the executive has, um, that, there, that there was so little conversation around, around uh, foreign policy. And I guess part of it is that um, I think the forces that were supporting uh, Biden, uh, the fact that uh, from 2016, there was complete realignment of, of ruling class elements uh, behind the Democrats and that, uh, that continued, uh, that there was sort of uh, an agreement uh, among those elements in terms of what should be the proper US foreign policy positions. And they knew that Biden represented those. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the questioning from the, uh, from the various uh, uh, journalists uh, was such where basically they kept the focus on domestic issues and that foreign policy. They really didn't want that to be discussed. And since uh, for reasons that aren't, aren't really that clear, the Biden, I mean, the Trump folks didn't recognize that there was some vulnerabilities there on the part of the uh, a Biden camp and, and didn't uh, sort of refocus attention on that. You know, the result was that basically Biden got a, uh, got a pass uh, and there was no real discussion um, in the campaign and even among, uh, you know, civil society. There was an assumption that uh, uh, you just had to get rid of, of Trump and everything would be just fine. It'd be a return to normal, but no one talked about what did normal look like and whether or not what was so-called normal was really in the best interest of not only the people in the U.S., but definitely the people in, in the global South who find themselves uh, constantly within the crosshairs of aggress aggressive U.S. policies. I mean, it seems like one untouchable topic these days, both in politics and in civil society, is the U.S. military budget, which, as we know, takes up over 50 percent of discretionary spending. You know, it's it's obscene. It's uh, 10 times as much as Russia's is. It's what? It's more than the next 10 countries combined, something like this. And when the conversation comes up of like, well, how do we pay for Medicare for all or something like that? Uh, that's like the perfect opportunity to be like, well, let's cut that military you know, budget. But then it never comes up. I remember that uh, when he was still a viable candidate that Sanders put out um, a document explaining how he was going to pay for all the different things that he wanted to put out there, like the forgiving student debt and all that. And there was a long list of all these different things that could happen and taxing billionaires more, et cetera. And, and certainly I'm not against taxing billionaires more, but he didn't mention a single thing about the, about the, the military budget. And I still don't hear anyone ever talk about it. And I, I have to say, I'm, I'm rather frustrated about that. Well, you know, because one reason why, why people are not talking about it is because, again, it seems to be a, a bipartisan consensus that the military would get not only what it wants, but even more so. When Donald Trump came into office and that first budget that he submitted to, uh, to Congress, uh, included a $54 billion increase in military spending. Now, in, in one of those few moments, and Donald is very interesting because Donald Trump just didn't know how to filter himself. So every once in a while, he would say something that was brutally honest. So he blurted out that he thought that that $54 billion was in fact uh, crazy. <laughs> right. <laughs> and at first, even 
Democrats were uh, raising questions about the increase until a couple of months later, I guess they got the memo and all of a sudden they went quiet. And not only that they give Donald Trump $54 billion increase, they increased it by almost another $30 billion that first year. I remember So that's this. been, that, that's been a, a bipartisan sort of uh, uh, consensus. Look, look what happened uh, a few months ago in, in the midst of the, the debates around the uh, stimulus package uh, where there was, they played like they, there was no agreement, even though I really believe that the agreement was not to have one passed before the election. Uh, but in all of these debates, what did they do? They're still able to come together and to and pass uh, a National Defense Authorization Act that increased military spending to $750 billion. So again, the evidence is quite clear. There's bipartisan support uh, to this, this, this obscene military budget. The issue we have as, as, as a people is to make that an issue, uh, to in right. fact demand that uh, our resources are redeployed uh, to address the objective human rights needs of the people. Because who is benefiting from this 700, really over a trillion dollars being spent on so-called defense? It is the fat cats uh, who are making the money. Uh, we are lining the pockets of these uh, military industrial complex uh, executives. Um, you know, everybody's making money off of this, uh, but the people and the people are the ones who are suffering as a consequence. So we have to demand that, you know, they, they, they reduce the spending, that they close down these over 800 military uh, bases worldwide, uh, transfer those resources back to the people, back to providing housing, uh, back to providing you know, uh, some decent health care, perhaps, cleaning up of the environment, you know, uh, uh, creating uh, a first class educational experience for our young people. But, you know, as long as the, the interests of the rulers prevail, then you're going to have these, this kind of obscene uh, behavior, these kind of obscene budgets um, that, uh, you know, will, will basically continue. Right. Right. And now you mentioned the, the over 800 military bases around the world. And this is one of the basic facts of U.S. foreign policy or U.S. empire, we should really say, I guess, imperialism, that seems generally unknown or is mentioned every once in a while and then is forgotten. I mean, the number of countries that the U.S. is involved in, in uh, sort of open warfare is what, seven, eight or nine, something like that. But then the number that there are military agreements with uh, and um, uh, small operations or special operations going on is much higher. And one thing that, that you and the Black Alliance for Peace uh, have um, been trying to talk about is AFRICOM, the military command in Africa and how uh, I guess all but one of the countries in Africa have uh, uh, some kind of military relationship with the United States. And so uh, maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that because um, that got its start under Bush and then got expanded under Obama, but it still it doesn't get nearly as much attention as it, as it needs to. You know, very few people, uh, as you say, very few people are aware of the, of the basing system uh, that the U.S. has in place. And it's important that we, we connect the bases to the, the global command structures that most people don't know about. So the first step that we take is helping people to understand that, there, that the U.S. has basically divi divided up the world into these command structures. Um, and to support those command structures, you have these international uh, bases uh, between 800 and 1,000, depending on how one defines a uh, base. So the work that we are involved in now with AFRICOM is uh, connected to that. Uh, the U.S. Africa Command was a, was one of the last of the commands before they created the Space Force. Mm -hmm. uh, that was created uh, October 1st, 2008, right before uh, Barack Obama assumed the office of the presidency. Um, and the objective there, of course, was to expand the uh, uh, U.S. the military presence on the Africa continent, um, and to to do that in order to try to uh, 
um, undermine the growing influence of the Chinese. The Chinese were involved in um, economic activity on the Africa continent, providing uh, you know, loans, helping to build infrastructure, uh, and building a base of political support um, in Africa from those activities. Uh, the U.S. was never prepared to engage in that kind of activity. As a matter of fact, they unleashed on the African continent, uh, the International Monetary Fund uh, and the World Bank uh, that basically uh, kept those economies in subjection. So, you know, they played the only hand that they felt that they could play or wanted to play, and that was a military hand. So they, uh, they ex started expanding AFRICOM uh, under the guise of assisting and encountering um, uh, 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 Islamic terrorism. Uh, but in the process of uh, this expansion, we saw again, the real agenda uh, when the US um, uh, operating behind and through NATO uh, destroyed the Libyan uh, economy, Libyan state uh, as part of the strategy or the uh, implementation of the strategy of full spectrum dominance. The notion that the US would be the global hegemon and that any, any regional state that seemed to be a threat to US interests uh, would in fact be destroyed. And that's why they destroyed uh, Libya because um, Libya held firm against uh, AFRICOM and having a, a, a AFRICOM base on the uh, African uh, continent. Uh, and so in 2011, um, Barack Obama uh, working through NATO, they destroyed the Libyan state. And so there's been a steady increase but like you said in your question, they are not impact, they are not increasing uh, boosts on the ground in a very dramatic way because they are depending on, on technology. Uh, and one of the things that we remind people of that under the Obama administration, there was a, a strategic shift in how the military was going to be used. Uh, they saw the uh, consequence of being bogged down in two theaters uh, Iraq and Afghanistan uh, and the growing uh, opposition to, to the war among the public. Uh, and so they sort of completed what Donald Rumsfeld uh, uh, advocated for, which was a more streamlined approach to military activity. Uh, and so they sort of create, they sort of completed that process of, of better utilizing U.S. Special Forces uh, in, in, in alignment with local military forces in order to advance their interests. So you have on in Africa, a, a military to military uh, relationship with 53 of the 54 African states. Uh, they are uh, training the, the, these militaries. Uh, they also are training um, African police forces. So we are trying to make people aware of the fact that we have these, this basing system, these command structures. Um, and we're asking a very simple question, whose interests are being carried out with this enormous expenditure of the public funds to have these troops, uh, to have these bases that are being built uh, in, um, in various parts of the world. Um, is that helping your family to get a better education? Uh, is that helping you to have some health care, a, a rec center in your community? Uh, do you have access to, to more uh, uh, capital if you want to start a business? I mean, you know, where is the emphasis? And see, if the Democrats have been raising those kind of questions of pursuing policies uh, that were more in alignment with uh, working class people and with the lower elements of the middle class or what we call the petty, the petty bourgeoisie, uh, perhaps the conditions would not have been in place. Uh, they would allow Donald Trump to win the office of the presidency. So, you know, these basic questions of whose interests are being served by these policies are the kind of questions that that have to be raised on the liberal part of the equation because they're being uh, raised among the radical right. And you see a radicalization taking place that culminated in terms of behavior uh, in January 6th. So, you know, there's a real disadvantage on the part of, of liberals and neoliberalism as long because they have surrendered their political positions to the neoliberal bourgeoisie and they have disarmed themselves politically and ideologically. Uh, and as a consequence, they have, they have ceded uh, a significant ideological space to the radical right. 
and they are playing a game uh, that's, 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 that's uh, very dangerous and one in which not only are they losing, uh, but I think, I think all of us are losing uh, as a consequence. Right, right. Yeah, no, you've, you've spoken about this before and had some of the other leftist thinkers about how the Democrats are no longer speaking up for the working class at all. And there's even fantasies among some Republicans, uh, um, uh, Mr. Cigar on that show, uh, Rising, which maybe you've seen, he's, he's a young, younger Republican who fantasizes about the Republican Party becoming the new party of the working mm -hmm. class. Exactly. I mean, they, they have some, you know, if you watch, if you, if you, if you read what, how they are, are articulating certain positions, uh, the narratives that are developing um, on, on the Republican side and the further right, rightist elements, um, they have some, 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 some strong arguments that could be attractive. And that might be one reason why uh, Silicon Valley is, is attempting to, to constrain uh, and constrict uh, the range of what is, is acceptable information to be disseminated. That's a whole other conversation, I think. But, you know, it, it's a very dangerous development in the sense that while they will raise these critiques of the economy, uh, expose or talk about the elites, uh, their solution uh, sounds very fascistic. And that's the problem. You see, the issue with Donald Trump and his forces, you know, <laughs> of course, you know, because people uh, reduce fascism or, or their understanding of fascism down to behaviorism, uh, and there's been too many bad uh, Hitler type movies uh, around, uh, that they didn't understand that, you know, there, there, there's a certain kind of class uh, uh, relationship that develops that uh, is really reflective of the, of the foundation of a fascistic uh, ordering of society. And that the danger of the Donald Trump forces uh, wasn't that they really represented a fascistic danger, uh, but that out of power and suffering or experiencing the kind of what they perceive to be repression that they are being exposed to today, they become more of a, of a danger now than when Donald Trump was in power because they were, in, you know, they were disorganized, relatively uh, ideologically incoherent. Um, and for me, they weren't, they weren't that dangerous even though they did represent some dangerous elements, okay? I'm, more con I'm, I'm concerned though with how the uh, ruling elements have used the Donald Trump threat uh, to, in fact, tighten up uh, the elements of the national security state uh, to, uh, to win, a, to, win uh, to a certain degree, general acceptance of the role of private corporations determining the range of acceptable ideals and information that can be disseminated. It to me is amazing that people are not seeing the danger of that. I mean, how else, how else can one see that than see Big Brother in action? You know, so it is a very dangerous situation that we see developing now. So for me, the kind of uh, threat that we're seeing now uh, um, that's more immediate is what I refer to as, as neoliberal totalitarianism, which has a fascistic character to it. So all, but all of these different tendencies are reflective of the, the deepening crisis of capital, the deepening crisis of capitalist society, you know, and the resolution of, of these crises uh, can only go one or two ways. There, in fact, will be a more uh, a pronounced and obvious uh, uh, phase of, of fascism, uh, or there's going to be a move toward social transformation. Uh, and move away from, from capitalism. Unfortunately, I think that before we get to that latter uh, place, uh, there's a very strong possibility we will have to go through a very serious phase of a more open and obvious fascism in the US. Yeah, now you just made a reference to neoliberalism as a form or expression of neo-fascism. And I heard you speak about this recently, I believe it was on Black Agenda, Radio, and I'm glad you brought it up because this was a new one for me to think about it that way. Yeah, you know, it, both of these are, in fact, uh, expressions of, of, of rightist tendencies. 
uh, expressions of fascism. Um, and so when I just said a moment ago that we're, we're probably gonna go through a, 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 a phase of, of, of fascism, it won't look the same way that the people I think are imagining it looking. I mean, when you see this, this, this dangerous uh, coalition of forces, of, of ruling class forces, Silicon Valley, uh, the military industrial complex, uh, the corporate media uh, companies uh, that control 90% of news and entertainment um, and elements of the state, the intelligence agencies. You know, it is, you see the foundation there. You see, because we, we already have the dictatorship of capital. I mean, one thing about the liberal bourgeois uh, democratic process is just, it, it provides a, a, a shell uh, for, for, the, for the, 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 the dictatorship of capital. Uh, uh, and but that that shell is now becoming almost like an impediment uh, for the for the for the uh, neoliberal bourgeoisie, uh, and so they are conditioning slowly the U.S. population to accept open fascistic kinds of of rule. Um, that's why they flaunt democracy. You know that's why you know Biden can talk about uh, he wants to center democracy and human rights, but then turn around. Uh, and support uh, uh, fascist, fascism in, in Haiti or right-wing elements uh, that are trying to take power in Venezuela. So not only do I talk about neo-fascism um, as having a neoliberal uh, character, it's important to understand that within the context of the global system, because for many years, this, this fascism that we've had in the US has been disguised because you can have forms of, of, of democracy, of democratic practice within the, the metropole, within the center, while the connected economies and societies that, that uh, the, the empire was, was uh, connected to, you had basically fascism, you know? So when we look at, at, at these relationships um, from the point of view of the oppressed, from the colonized, we say someone explained to us when we didn't have fascism. You know? right. So we, you know, for me, uh, I'm, I'm, tr I'm hoping that people are, are alerted uh, to this friendly fascism, you know, in, in a sense that's being developed because in many ways it's more insidious because it's not being recognized. So you know, for four years, they had us fixated on the theatrics of a Donald Trump. Yeah, and that incoherent and the, the clownish kind of behavior over there, while they were systematically tightening up, you know, the the national security state, the conditioning of the population to to accept uh, uh, an Aurelian, you know, Big Brother, uh, double speak, new speak kind of of environment. I mean, it's very very uh, very very troubling what's unfolding now because elements who you would think would be uh, 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 hip to it and in opposition, uh, they've been actually helping to go along with it. Just yesterday, the nation uh, jumped on this whole uh, Facebook thing and called Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook um, dangerous to democracy. Why? Because he, they won't engage in even more censorship. I mean, this is, to me, it's, it's, it's sort of, uh, it's kind of crazy. Now, you've made a point about this particular topic of social media before, where you've talked about how our public space has been privatized. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it, no one is no other way that one can can understand that it's been privatized, it's been colonized. Um, and as a consequence, you know, it's becoming more and more difficult for alternative information to be disseminated. Look, they, and they've been wanting to do this for quite some time. Ever since they saw the possibilities and the dangers of, of the internet and social media, you know, you might recall that at one point, uh, you know, they were attacking what they were, people referred to as uh, citizen, citizen journalists, uh, that they weren't authoritative. Uh, you know, they were, you know, just making things up and blah, blah, blah. There's always been a concern that, that, uh, 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 information and that approved by the authorities uh, would uh, be disseminated and would be the source of real political opposition uh, in this country and really with it throughout the entire West. Uh, but they never had the nerve to 
engage in open censorship. But with Russian Gate, uh, they had that opportunity to begin to lay that, that ideological foundation. Uh, and they did it, and they did it with a vengeance. So that now four years later, uh, you can have the nation uh, calling for censorship and no one bats an eye. Yeah, now the internet, my, my memory of the internet goes back to, to, to even the days before the, before the web, to when there were, you know, text only bulletin boards and all this right. kind of thing, you know? And yeah. at, at one time there really was, I think, um, uh, uh, I think the medium was, or the, was democratic at one time, or, or uh, certainly far more than it is now. In the early 2000s, I was involved with the indie media movement, which you might remember, IMC, yes. Independent Media Center, right? That came out of yeah. Seattle, the WTO. And for a blip there, like, 1999 to like 2003, 2005 or so, like indie media was actually kind of a force to be reckoned with and really was out there. And, and in Portland, where I was involved with in it, we were starting to have an effect on the local media there where mm -hmm. some of like the, the, the weeklies had to kind of change their tone on some stories every once in a while because of things that we would bring up. It was, it was a pretty exciting time, you know? But then I remember that social media came along shortly after that. I think first it was MySpace, then Facebook. And that's really kind of where it all went downhill, you know? Mm -hmm. And I feel like, I feel like that to some degree, the peak of alternative media uh, on the internet is past us, uh, that it was maybe a decade ago. And there's still obviously some use to the internet and to social media. I mean, the George Floyd protests would not have happened the way that they did last year, if not for everyone being able to share these short video clips, for example. But mm -hmm. it, it does feel as though um, the medium is not as useful to us as it used to be uh, in alternative media on the left. And I don't know how that can improve. I wonder if you have any, any thoughts about that. Well, let me ask, let me ask you this question. If not uh, social media, where would the left be in communication with the masses? Right. What's right. the alternative? Newspapers right. have disappeared, physical newspapers. And I, I, I think that I think that the 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 ruling elements understand that, and that's why when you when you violate the community standards of say Facebook, what's your punishment? Your punishment is is, is exclusion for right. a month or two weeks or whatever. They recognize that when you are excluded from social media, you experience almost a degree of social death. So until we are able to uh, really create alternatives to some of these popular social media platforms, uh, you know, we, we, we're in trouble. So we, so many of us who understand and see how they are moving, we're just trying to, uh, you know, organize as rapidly as we can. Uh, we are learning how not to uh, evoke certain kinds of responses from, uh, from the censors. People ask me all the time, uh, Ajama, you be writing some wild stuff. How, how do you escape that? Well, there's certain key words that I don't use, mm -hmm. okay? You know, but I want to have access to these platforms for as long as possible. Because as long as we can, you know, uh, uh, talk to, you know, thousands of people on Twitter and, and get your stuff spread, spread uh, around the world on, on, on uh, Facebook and, and all of this, we've got to use it right now. And so I'm not seeing any alternative at this point. Um, and except that it's one of the things I think some of us have, have, have never abandoned because it's a little bit diff more difficult for them to control and that is the use of, of electronic mail uh, and building communities that way. So if we, when we get thrown off, at least we have some ability to communicate with folks. But, and then going back even to using direct mail, I mean, we gotta go back, we may have to go back at some point to old school. And it's funny because Many people have forgotten that before we had all of this stuff, we we, we still managed to organize, right? You know, right. I mean, so we we've got to, to go get... back and figure out how to go back right. and do it. Right. I mean, in the sixties, we there managed was, to, you to know... bring people to the streets. Right. Right. I mean, you know, they would get exactly. a million people to exactly. DC in the sixties through through flyers and posters. Exactly. And but phone you know, trees. And mm -hmm. phone trees. But you know, it's like this. You know. Uh, most uh, modern people today, they don't know how to eat. Mm -hmm. They have lost the ability to prepare food. Right. You know, 
And, and so you, you got to find someone that has the old school ways of doing stuff to teach you how to really cook and all this. The right. same thing is happening with, with, with those of us who are doing uh, activist work, organizing work. We have uh, two generations now who, if we had to go back to old school methods, they would be completely lost. Right. <laughs> That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. I mean, there could be breakdowns in, in the system as, as, as well, but I think that, yeah, the, the, the stakes will just be much higher than in, in a number of ways. But um, I want to, to, to change the subject slightly to something else I heard you talking about recently. Uh, well, you talk about in general, which is the topic of decolonization. Yes. So decolonization being something that needs to happen around the world, something that needs to happen here. And uh, within the context of decolonization, uh, does the United States, do we need to dismantle the United States as part of that? Well, um, the short answer is yes, because the, the United States is, is, is a settler colonial project, a settler colonial state. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's had um, a continuity uh, since uh, 1791, uh, once uh, the uh, uh, new constitutional process was finalized um, and that process just basically um, uh, um, uh, 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 resulted in uh, the consolidation of the power of the colonists uh, that were on the land since, you know, 1619. Uh, so, you know, you know you, even with the Civil War, uh, there's been continuity because the, you know, the U.S. national state won that conflict with the Confederacy. Uh, so, you know, the very fact that the U.S., uh, the material basis of the U.S. Uh, was the, 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 the conquering of this land, uh, the enslavement, people don't forget about that, that the uh, Native people also were sub subjected to slavery at certain points, uh, and then the confinement of, of Native peoples to uh, concentration camps that we refer to as uh, re reservations. Um, it provides a, a moral, not only critique, but it provides the, the moral foundation for how a just resolution uh, has to look. That it can't just be, um, you know, uh, saying I'm sorry, um, and that's it, or even reparations, whatever that's supposed to be, uh, has to be in fact a dismantling of this power, a dismantling of the settler colonial state. And that process of dismantling the settler colonial state and the uh, colonial capitalist system uh, requires a decolonization of one's consciousness. So it, it goes hand in hand. That process of decolonizing uh, one's consciousness is a process in which, when, which you are able, you, you root out the ideological foundations of white supremacy. You know, in this society, in this white supremacist settler colonial society, everyone who is born, no matter what your ethnicity, nationality, or race, or whatever, you are, you are subjected to and you become, and this is a white supremacist, it is part and parcel of the DNA of, of the US experience. You are taught uh, white supremacy from the very first moments that you go to school, uh, what you are exposed to in popular education. It is so pervasive that it is, is, is not even uh, recognized. It becomes just common sense. So you have to go through a process of, of, of purging oneself of that. I'm not seeing Europe as the, the apex of, 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 of civilizational development, you know, of understanding that there are other people on this planet who had civilizations and who, who live certain kind of ways that have to be recognized and respected, uh, you know, who, who, you know who, who have value just as much as the lives of, of Europeans. You have to rid yourself of, of Eurocentrism because it's so pervasive you won't even see it. So process of, of decolonization structurally uh, requires a simultaneous process, maybe even prior process of, of uh, decolonizing one's consciousness, decolonizing uh, knowledge, decolonizing the very basis of being, okay? So that is the simultaneous process we have to engage in uh, in this country and really throughout the entire uh, Western world because the very notion of modernity, what is uh, uh, you know, human development has to be rethought. 
uh, has to be rethought. And part of, the, of, the, of that rethinking is part of the decolonization process, decentering Europe, decentering the entire uh, process of modernity. Right. So this involves obviously some study of history, I would say, but then also some very personal self-reflection on, on the part of people as well. Exactly. It, it really does. And, um, and, you know, but one of the things that we stress is that while that self-reflection is important, uh, study is important, um, that we emphasize, though, that it is a strong Uh, the material basis of white power. And what do we mean, mean by that? Structures of white supremacy, including not only the capitalist system, the colonial capitalist system itself economically, but it's structures like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the WTO, uh, the hegemony of, of, of the dollar. Okay? These structures that the banking system, these structures have to be, dis have to be dis uh, uh, dismantled. Um, the material basis for white power has to be uh, removed if we're ever going to be able to come to terms uh, with white supremacy. So we're not just concerned about what's in people's heads, as important as that is. Uh, we are more, that's why some of us don't uh, define ourselves as anti-racist. Uh, we are opposed to white supremacy. So that has both an ideological component to it, uh, but even more importantly, a structural uh, component. And so we want to focus in on those uh, institutions and structures that uphold uh, white supremacy. Right. Like, for example, does that make sense. It does. Now I was going to ask just to, to see um, to see if I if I've got it. Uh, so like in South Africa, when apartheid was finally dismantled. There was a process there by which black people were finally allowed to vote and to get positions of power. And yet the economic, much of the economic power was still held on to by the, the whites as it previously had been. And so there was political power that was ceded, but not economic power. So that's, that's somewhat like you're talking about. It, it is, it is somewhat, but you know what was also interesting about that example is mm -hmm. that I would argue that even though uh, Africans had a certain degree of, of political power because they were able to occupy uh, uh, parts of the state, white supremacy was never dislodged, not only in terms of, of the economic power of the white minority ruling class, but the power of white culture. It was never dislodged. You know, the, the, the values that still define white uh, South African society uh, the values that uphold uh, capitalist relationships uh, that uh, has that served as a foundation for uh, these same Africans who were fighting for liberation. Uh, many of them, uh, a number of them now, are now millionaires, including the, the current president of South Africa. And that being all right because of the inculcation of, of, of those kind of capitalist values. So, you know, the, 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 the decolonial process in South Africa really never took hold, not yet. So your example is a good one, but your example is, is an example of the continuation of, of, of white power and, set, and in essence really a settler colonial project. Right, I mean, I, I have to kind There's of- There's been no liberation in South Africa. Right, right, I mean, yeah, Naomi Klein wrote about this in the shock doctrine, that's kind of where I, I got those, those ideas right there. But, but um, so, so, so this makes me wonder, I mean, to what degree is is modern the modern techno technical technological and industrial state like dependent on white supremacy then? Because uh, the wealth that is produced to make it happen, this happens from these structures. The uh, but then also uh, you know we look at our phones and our other technology, and it's a a, a, a colonial and a white supremacist process, which is. Um, extracting those materials. I mean, we know about the child slave labor in Africa, et cetera, all these things that are happening, you know? So, so how is it even, is, is it even possible, I wonder, to have modern life 
at this point without without it. And I'm speaking also as someone who 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 at heart is sort of anti-civilization and anti and kind of a primitivist. So I'm not gonna. <laughs> we we might differ on that. But but I I, I you know. Um, I mean, can they even be separated at this point? Can we make a can we make a cell phone without without colonialism? I guess I'm I'm asking in a way. That that's a very important and profound question. Um, you know, the relationships of colonialism are such that that when they are separate, there will be a it has to be a change in uh, what we consume, how we consume how we relate to, uh, to, to nature. Um, and that's part of the process. Now we, we can't turn back the hands of time. We have these industrial processes, uh, but right now those industrial processes and the technologies that's being developed are such that they are being, now they are almost instruments against collective humanity. So part of, of the decolonization process is when we take hold of those uh, those, those, those technological innovations and industrial processes that they have to be reorganized in a way that is that makes more sense, that uh, helps to, to elevate life and to protect life. Uh, and that means a lot of profound changes. Like for example, what might that mean uh, for, for these mega cities that we have? Are we going to continue? Can we afford to continue with these kind of mega cities? Uh, um, you know, when we take hold of the industrial base, uh, maybe we would be able to reorganize agriculture, for example, in a different kind of way that will allow people to be able to leave these cities and go back uh, to the countryside and engage in small plot farming, okay, for local and national markets. You know, so the, the whole logic and rationale of capitalist society has to be looked at in a new way. Uh, and there are uh, a number of, of movements that are in fact doing that, uh, that uh, uh, make an argument that we've got to completely reorganize every aspect of society if we're going to be able to survive. Because one of the uh, other obvious contradictions and consequences of the industrial processes we have is that we're basically destroying the ability of human beings to sustain themselves on this planet. Now, Mother Earth is going to survive. She might be uh, altered in many ways, but uh, we're the ones who are going to destroy our ability to live on this planet. So until we are able to uh, seize power from this minority of, of the human population that is invested in production processes and social relations that force all of us to have to work for them, that puts profit over the planet and over people, uh, then that kind of irrational uh, production will continue to our detriment. So we have, we have a, a vested interest in a global revolutionary process. You know, the, the, the major contradiction that Marx identified was between uh, the capitalists and the workers. And that's a, a, continue, a continued contradiction. But with the, this, this stage of, of monopoly capital, and, and, mon and monopoly global capital uh, and the, the irrationality of this pro these processes. The contradiction, the major, con the major contradiction today, in my opinion, is between uh, 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 capitalism, the capitalist class and collective humanity. We have to take power from these, these maniacs if we're going to survive. survive. So there's a, an objective material uh, need for us uh, to, to recognize uh, that we have an interest in taking power back uh, from the capitalist class if we want to survive for ourselves and for our children. So this is, these are the kind of things we have to look at. And when we take power, then what kind of societies do we build? And that is the other part of the conversation because you have some people that will argue that there's some models being developed that represent uh, how a a post-capitalist society might look. Well, maybe, but there's some things in some of these models that some of us don't want to follow, you know? And so what would be uh, created remains to be seen. But if we are guided by a new kind of ethical framework, uh, a framework that is based on, an, on cooperation, uh, based on equality, based on censoring rationality, 
um, and decency. You know, I think we will collectively be able to figure out how to reorganize society in ways uh, that will uh, ensure that we can survive uh, and live as decent human beings in a new kind of world. I think we can do that. Right, right. And and so, I'm glad you brought up ecology uh, because when some people get on these topics and where, where we go next and all, um, one suggestion that is sometimes is made is to uh, take the example of various indigenous cultures around the world um, or take leadership of indigenous people around the world uh, for a number of reasons, one of which is that they are still living in societies which are, are sustainable. And in a lot of cases, these people are on the front lines of these battles that are going on right now too. The people in the Amazon who are, you know, defending their actual homes, you know, mm-hmm. from being, you know, their, their, their home from being clear cut, you know, for, for, you know, big agriculture and all the different things that are, that are happening there. Or here in the, in the U S there's more and more talk about, you know, um, giving land back, you know, and it seems to me that this is really, this is, this is part of the dec- decolonization project too, is to, is to sort of, that here in the U.S., we really need to remind ourselves that in a very real way, the quote, Indian wars never really ended. Exactly. No, and, that, and that's what I referred to, that the, the movements and peoples around the world that are rethinking the very basis of, of modernization. Uh, right. That are, 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 are arguing that, that we've got to transcend the modern, uh, that we have to have e- uh, effective and real uh, decolonization, which means a, 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 a real reorganization of society and how we relate to one another. So yes, it is those peoples um, who are still on the land, who are still, uh, who have, whose cultures have not been completely destroyed, who have uh, uh, alternative critical ideals that uh, are really engaged in, in, in these struggles uh, the, around how to develop new ways of living. And those new ways of living also often means tapping back, going back and pulling back uh, you know, into, the, into the modern context, the current context, uh, those elements of how human beings live uh, that uh, has to serve as a basis for, uh, for building new society. So it's not a so- sense of, of just going back in time and, and all of that because we can't right. do that. But there are the elements of these indigenous cultures and practices uh, that have currency today. Uh, and those practices, uh, our understanding of, 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 of science and technology, you know, uh, if we have, again, a, a, the ethical uh, foundation um, and the will and the power, I think we can figure out how to, how to save our humanity and right. build new societies. Right. So again, coming back to, to basically the, the first step here is, is taking power from the current small class of, it's a very small number of people really who are, who are running things. Exactly. That's, that's, look, it, we've got to center the, the question of revolutionary uh, change uh, and not be afraid of that, of that idea that uh, if you could, if you're concerned about your, your, your family and your friends and your, and your children, you know, this, this is this thing is unsustainable and so we've got to prepare ourselves and engage in the kind of revolutionary change we've got to engage in because if not these folks are going to destroy all of us look the you you have u.s policymakers talking about a winnable nuclear encounter with the chinese or even with the russians you know right they want to you know you know going back to that question of of, of basing you know, part of the, the pivot to Asia that the Obama administration started, uh, they wanted to complete that process because what they want to do also too is to stage intermediate uh, nuclear uh, uh, missiles around the Chinese using countries like the Philippines. You know, these people are insane. They've already committed almost two trillion dollars to upgrade uh, the U.S. nuclear arsenal, even as uh, global humanity. Uh, passed a resolution in the United Nations back in 2017 calling for the pro- prohibition of all nuclear weapons. Well, many people don't realize that that was passed and that uh, you had the, the requisite 50 uh, states uh, that now it, it became part of international law back in January. 
So in essence, you know, you know, uh, uh, nuclear weapons have been outlawed. Now we're trying to get more and more states to sign on. Okay, so humanity is going one way, and these maniacs who have uh, economic power are in another place. And again, it is a contradiction, and that contradiction can only be resolved when we are able to take power from those elements. Right, right. In the interest of of seeking seeking that that path, how much, how much, how much attention is it worth for us to give to electoral politics in the United States? It's a tactical question for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it really depends. You know, um, you have millions of people that participate in the electoral process. I think what happens in the U.S. is that because of the monopoly of the two parties and the focus on the of the national uh, contest. Uh, people forget about uh, political possibilities on the local level, and particularly if you organize, if you organize movements uh, that's focused on trying to win certain uh, local offices, why are you also building outside of the electoral process? Uh, mm -hmm. So this whole concept of dual power, I think, is is important. So um, you know, for me, it's a it's a it's a tactical question, a strategic and tactical question. Uh, we do know that. We're not going to uh, uh, ultimately transform societies through just the electoral process because even if we were committed to that, we know that the, the ruling class elements are not going to allow their power to be taken uh, without a fight. They're going to be ones to, who are going to engage in, 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 in violence, or they're already doing it, using the power of the state. They already are laying the ideological framework or foundation for that. Um, I mean, that's why they're not going to um, uh, give up the police or the prison system, you know, um, because these are the front lines in the uh, protection of their interests. And they're not going to give these things up uh, without a fight. So, you know, we've got to prepare ourselves for, uh, for the fight if we are serious about, uh, about transformation, because uh, I think the other side is serious about maintaining their power. Uh, the problem we have is that we can't afford that to continue. Right, right. And then for our part, um, we need to be involved. We need to be organized in a very real physical sense in order to do this, like within actual organizations. Exactly. And, 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 and the challenge we have in the U.S. is that the organizing culture is so weak. Mm -hmm. And it's so weak because we have such a weak civil society. We don't have, I mean, you know, remember the, the uh, uh, Boley and, uh, what was the book? Uh, uh, all the books that were coming out that indicated how socially isolated people are today. Right. That the civic uh, organizations, the, bo the, the bowling clubs and the, the baseball clubs and the things that used to uh, define community, they no longer exist, you know? And so there's not a lot of experience that people have and coming together in, in civic, uh, civic organizations and in um, the practice of democracy. For them, uh, the, the highest expression of democracy is, is going to vote uh, who your uh, oppressors are going to be every two or four years. Right. Uh, and so any, any idea of democracy of, of beyond that is somewhat uh, alien. So yes, we've got to organize ourselves, but we have such a tremendous uh, challenge even in that, uh, because this society uh, uh, helps to reinforce a notion of powerlessness. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't cultivate a sense of agency. Uh, you put your agency in someone else's um, hands, uh, and so part of the, our challenge is not only in terms of, of trying to win consciousness, uh, but also uh, giving people an opportunity to to have some experiences. Uh, they will allow them to begin to in engage in activities where they can govern themselves. The people have to understand that they can govern themselves. That's the essence of, of radical democracy. And that's part of the, of the program that we have to embrace. Uh, we can't just uh, uh, perpetuate the illusion that uh, these uh, elections represent democracy. They don't. Uh, they represent an illusion. We have to teach uh, and ground ourselves collectively in a sense of democracy and democracy goes beyond those elections. It goes, it means having the ability to, to control every aspect of your life. 
politically, economically, socially. Um, and that's the, the, the lessons we have to learn collectively. Right. And now Jackson, Mississippi is a place where people have been trying to do this with some success, I understand. There, there's one of the models that people are looking at. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I was involved in, in, in that, I'm still involved in that process. Of, okay. uh, a member of the board of the first board of Cooperation Jackson. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and I was a contributor to the, the book. Um, um, uh, now I forgot the title. I think you know what I'm talking about. I do. Uh, mm-hmm. Jackson Rising. Jackson, Jackson Rising. Rising, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, so yes, very important. I mean, the, you have to create the, the new institutions even within the womb of the old. So building uh, cooperatives, uh, giving people an opportunity to learn how to govern themselves is exactly what they're trying to do there is what I'm talking about. Uh, and that has to be replicated across this country. Uh, we have to build new kinds of organizations. One of the, the civil linings of the COVID process uh, was people started engaging what they, they define as mutual aid projects. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and that's good because what that is doing is giving people uh, an opportunity to learn how to organize, okay? And to maybe build new kinds of organizations because what we have to build on the community level, we have to be able to address the material needs of people. Uh, and so and we got to learn how to, how to, in fact, do that, how to map out communities, how to build relationships. Uh, that's how you build dual power. So people are getting some practical experiences in how to engage in that kind of organization. And that's helping to uh, confront some of the, of the issues I just spoke about a minute ago in terms of the, the lack of, of civic uh, involvement uh, and civic uh, experiences. Right. So which we've, we've kind of come around to that old catchphrase, um, uh, think globally, act locally in a way. Exactly. And, and that's the only way we can only um, think and, and see the world but that's the only way we can exist. We are part of collective humanity. You know, one of the things we're doing in Black Alliance for Peace is we're trying to revive that sense of, of internationalism. That uh, so, so people understand that there's no way we can solve our problems within the context of the U.S. only, because the U.S. is part of a global system, uh, and and so and we are part of global humanity. So you know we've got to. Uh, be in, in alignment uh, with the people of Haiti, uh, with the people of, of Venezuela, uh, with the people who are struggling to try to transform themselves because they are up against the same system that we're up against. We just in the US and there's a national expression of that system, but it's the same global uh, colonial capitalist system. So the basis for, uh, for real solidarity uh, exists uh, is, is, you know, we just have to help people understand uh, that their interest is in building solidarity with other oppressed people, uh, with other people who are thinking about things in a new way, who are attempting to, to imagine societies functioning in a new way. That's where we need to be putting our attention. That is the basis of our solidarity and that identifying with the interests uh, of, of our, our, ruling, our ruling class uh, who all they want to present to the to the U.S. population is fear and anger and hostility. You know, we've got to hate and fear the Russians or the Chinese or the Iranians or, you know, fill in the blank, you know, because it's in their interest that we do that. So our task is to win people back. Our task is to try to build um, uh, a, a revolutionary consciousness. Um, our task is to prepare of the people uh, for the horrific fight that we have to wage. Right, and there's many prongs of this of this fight, many different efforts, many different many different ways for people to engage in it. Really, in in both yeah. practical and well, I mean, in all all in practical ways, but some are more hands on, and maybe some are more related to education and that kind of thing. Exactly. Everybody does have have to be out knocking on doors. Okay, that everybody has a, a role to play as an educator, as uh, a, a community activist, uh, uh, you know, working in the hospitals, you know, everybody has a role to play. Everybody has a mouth where they can engage in, in active agitation, education, 
Um, you know, we all have roles to play in our various respective um, areas. Uh, but what we can do is to, to recognize our interconnectedness, uh, to recognize we are part of something beyond ourselves uh, and to never let you know, the enemy uh, uh, make us believe that we in the majority cannot defeat them. And, and that's our task also, so, so people to understand that, you know, we have the ability to build power and to actually transform the world once we realize uh, our potential power. Right, right. Globally, I often think that probably the, the global battle might well be led by people in other countries who have more oomph left. Uh, sometimes it feels as though the U.S. is kind of a, a spent force, but I, I don't want that to be true. But but it, but it is. See, right. The, the revolutionary, the revolutionary uh, impetus has long left the West, unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Uh, and and that's why you know uh, the best that we can do is prepare ourselves to be in solidarity with with the masses around the world uh, to help put a break on U.S. imperialism. Uh, but in terms of a leadership of a global revolutionary process coming out of the West, it's not going to happen. Okay. It's too, the, the, the Western left is too corrupt. It's too, too left, too soft, too corrupt, uh, too uh, ideologically and emotionally in alignment with its bourgeoisie. Uh, and that's why you see the kind of uh, incredible activity on the part of the, of the left. You know, when, when there's a, a coup in, in Bolivia, Instead of, of people mobilizing to condemn the coup, we want to engage in these torturous conversations around what kind of mistakes that Morales make. Right. Okay, we let's just we could do that, but we don't do that right now. Now right. your responsibility is to put a break on your criminal government. Right. Okay, you know those of you who have never made revolution any place, but yet you know people are expert revolutionaries in the West. You know, so no, we've got to understand that, look what's happening in Latin America. You got uh, the possibility of, of return of a, of, a, of a progressive government in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. You got the, the return of, 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 of a movement towards socialism in Bolivia. You got the Venezuelans holding on. You got, uh, uh, you know, some progressive things happening in Nicaragua. You got the Cubans holding on. You got a fight taking place uh, in, in Haiti, um, you know, the, the, the momentum, you know, is, is still on our side. And the Americas is so important because it is the Americas that serve as the material base for the creation and, evo and, and, and uh, evolution of, of a Western Europe. So, you know, the, con the conditions and the contradictions uh, created in the Americas are such where it's, it's not, it's understandable that the most progressive uh, movements right now taking place on the planet, in my opinion, uh, is taking place right here uh, in, in, this, in this area, this region. Now you have some other really important things happening even in places like India, where you had just a few couple of months ago, the biggest uh, uh, worker strike in the history of humanity. Yeah, all those farmers. 300 million people went out on strike. Right. Okay, so there is, and, and, and believe me, the bourgeoisie sees all of this. Mm -hmm. That's why they're concerned. That's why they want to try to, to, to contain and control this to the extent uh, that they can. I really appreciate this point you make about, about, about looking to the other people who are successfully um, having revolutions uh, or, or, or trying to. And, and, and because I feel like part of American exceptionalism as it infects the left is the idea that uh, we should, or that we're even able to come up with uh, uh, decent answers at this point when it comes to these things. Exactly, and, 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 and we can't. And the question of, of adhering to, to leadership, sorry, uh, I'm gonna have to jump off this in a second. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have to we have to we have to really uh, um, um, subordinate ourselves to the leadership that's developing uh, in other parts of the world. People are really engaged in concrete struggles for power, uh, for social transformation. Uh, they're learning valuable lessons, uh, and we have to learn from them. Uh, but there's not much 
that we can we can provide people. We have some experiences that are valuable, uh, but um, the notion that uh, leadership is going to come out of the U.S. or Western Europe again, uh, I, I don't see it. It's impo- almost impossible. Thank you. Uh, so maybe you could just uh, we could wrap up here by you can tell us uh, where people can follow you and your work. Well, thank you. I've really been really enjoyed this conversation, and and I'm. I've been reminded to remind people that uh, I have a, a Twitter account, so you can follow me at, uh, at Ajamu Baraka. Uh, and please come check out the work of the Black Alliance for Peace at blackallianceforpeace.com. Uh, we have some actions we really want people to sign. Uh, we are only one of few that are talking about the Afghan peace process, uh, and we don't understand why, but we are. Uh, we want people to sign that petition demanding that uh, the Biden administration not undermine that process. They're trying to figure out how to stay in Afghanistan. We want them out. Uh, We have uh, another important petition uh, where we are educating people on the existence of the Department of Defense uh, 1033 program, the program primarily responsible for uh, militarizing police forces across the uh, the planet, across the country. We want the Biden administration to shut that program down. And we got actions on Haiti. Uh, we have a Haiti page. Uh, you can go, you can sign uh, a letter that we've been circulating. We have now over 800 organizations and individuals uh, calling on the Biden administration to stop uh, providing support uh, to the uh, a dictator, the puppet regime of Jovenel uh, Mosi, Moet Moise. Uh, and so we want people to, to support that also. So please do that. I'll support the work uh, and I, I will see you next time we have a chance to talk. Thanks, thanks. I would just add to that that I would encourage people to sign up to get emails from the Black Alliance for Peace because I'm on that list and a lot of times I see your announcements there and nowhere else. I don't see them on social media or other places, but I'll see them in my email. And so that's wow. really, that's again, this is the not depending entirely on social media is I think so important these days. So. Exactly. So thanks so much for spending some time to me today uh, with me today. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I really, really enjoyed it. Let's do it again. Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.